What's up, guys? Doc and Jock Podcast here. It's me, Doc Danny. And again, I'm by myself, Coach Joe's in here because I am at the Clinical Athlete Summit this weekend in Asheville. And I'm talking with Zach Long, a.k.a. the Barbell Physio. Not the other way around, right? Thanks for getting it right this time. Right. Yeah. Who, we, <laughs> who we've, we've talked to before. And, uh, we're, you know, Zach was here presenting on um, blood flow restriction. And I thought it was a really good presentation. And some of the application where we, we, we previously talked to Johnny Owens um, about blood flow restriction. And it's, it's a very interesting way to, to build strength, endurance, and even some cardiovascular strength um, as well. And, uh, and looking at the applications that we can use in the clinical setting, but also in the gym, which is what people really care about, which is, is performance. So, um, Zach, for people that haven't listened to your podcast, why don't you give everybody a, a, a little intro on yourself, um, and then we'll get into some of the specifics on what we want to talk about. All right. I'm a uh, doctor of physical therapy. I run the website, thebarbellphysio.com. I was fortunate enough to start out working in strength and conditioning at college and high school levels, and then went on to get my doctorate in PT, and I'm at the pl- spot right now in my career where I get to combine those two things and help athletes recover from injuries and then learn how to keep themselves healthier and performing optimally. Perfect. And your practice is in? Charlotte, North Carolina. Charlotte. So if you're in Charlotte, check them out. Um, and let's get into it. So blood flow restriction, let's give a quick uh, kind of summary of what blood flow restriction is. All right. So we put a tourniquet either on the proximal thigh, the upper thigh, or the upper arm, and that's going to restrict the amount of blood flow that comes into the extremity and completely restrict the amount of blood flow that comes out. Long story short, it means that people can get strength and hypertrophy gains at really, really low loads. So typically we need to lift loads greater than 65% of their one rep max to create hypertrophy. With blood flow restriction, we can do that with loads between 20 and 30% of their one rep max. So essentially you can load somebody with less weight and still get a strength change and a hypertrophy change. Yes, the hypertrophy changes tend to be equal to maybe even a little bit better than our typical high-intensity resistance exercise. The strength gains are not as good as if you were lifting heavy weights, but it has the benefit of because you're only using really light weights, you don't create the big muscle damage that you do with high-intensity resistance exercise. So if we were to look at a formula for what, what it takes to create muscle. Net protein gains, net muscle gains is equal to muscle protein synthesis minus muscle protein breakdown. So if you add more bricks to your house than are broken, your house becomes bigger. Blood flow restriction doesn't break down the muscle, so nobody's taking your bricks away, but it does add bricks. So you can get a a really good hypertrophy gain uh, but again, the strength gains aren't quite as good as if you were lifting heavy weights. There's there's no cheating the need to lift heavy weights to get really strong. And, and a lot of this too, the, the cool part about this is it's it's almost like a it's almost like a uh, biohack sort of. Um, it's it's the hormone change. It seems like it's the most important part. Where it, so if 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 Zach and I didn't change the way we trained, but yet we pumped ourselves full of some sort of steroid that would cause an increase in hormones, we would get bigger. Not changing the way that we eat, we would lose fat and we would get bigger. And this is hormones, right? So don't discount the fact of how much hormones play into effect of um, people being bigger or smaller or anything like that. And and you did a good job of of showing up uh, the Belgian blue cow, which if you haven't seen a Belgian blue cow, go look one of these up. Be careful if you Google Im- image this, by the way. I showed this to a patient recently. I Google imaged Belgian blue cow, and like one of the top images is Belgian blue cows having sex. So <laughs> be super careful with that. It, if you're, you never know you're going to see what Google images. But um, the hormone side of it is cool. So what are the hormones that get uh, upregulated a lot? So you get increased growth hormone, which growth hormone does not play – a big role in protein synthesis or hypertrophy, it does play a role in collagen synthesis. Basically meaning that growth hormone is going to help your tendons and muscle collagen repair better. So if you have a tendon injury, growth hormone might help you recover faster from that injury. If you're trying to keep your tendons really strong, growth hormone is going to help with that. It's not going to make you jacked. Right. Um, but recovery, and that's why recovery a lot of is, is, is yeah is very important, and that's why you know if you look at 
bikers, mm -hmm. cyclists, are very well known for taking growth hormone. Right. But if you look at them and while they're in shape and they have big legs, like they're not jacked like bodybuilders despite the yeah. volume of work they do with their legs. Right. The growth hormone just helps them recover and stay as healthy as possible. Yeah. Uh, that's the first hormone. The next hormone is IGF-1, which IGF-1 is a regulator of muscle mass. That is significantly increased with blood flow restriction. Uh, myostatin is a uh, is, is a gene that blocks cell growth and with blo both blood flow restriction and high intensity resistance exercise that gene is kind of shut down a little bit so it's kind of like you you take the brakes off of muscle gain or yeah yeah, it's cool. The, the myostatin stuff is interesting. It's so think of myostatin as the the more myostatin you have, the less um, muscle you'll probably lean muscle you'll have uh, as a, a, at a set point. Like without you training, you, you ever see some of these people that they don't lift a thing and they're ripped. All right, they probably have less myostatin than somebody that has to work really hard to gain muscle, right? Yeah. And and that's that's kind of the genetic set point that people have or don't have. Um, but it's really a it's a developmental um, uh, set point. It, it, it's energy costly for us to carry a lot of muscle around, right? So if we're hunter gatherers, it's it's better for us to actually require less energy to survive. So it's 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 one of the ways it's been explained to me is where myostatin comes from versus a Belgian blue cow. If you look one of these up, they are enormous. They look like Hulk Hogan, you know, as a cow, and and uh, but but they don't exercise. They eat grass and walk around. They look like they're ready for a bodybuilding show. They do. They're incredibly ripped, and and there's some interesting studies where they took them out of rats, and they show these these rats side by side from the same um, you know uh, uh, like brother and sister rats, where one they took myostatin out of, and these are just massive, massive rats compared to the ones that they didn't do it with. So it's it's an interesting way of looking at it, and the hormones and some of these things, but. But really, where, where's all supply? So in your practice, so from a clinical practice, um, how, are you how are you utilizing blood flow restriction training, and where are you seeing your best results from? So I think we can break that up into three groups. We got our post-op patients, our regular injury patients, and performance clients. Post-op patients, basically, after a surgery, you have a variety of different restrictions based on the surgery and the exact tissue quality that you dealt with that limit how much you can do. So you can't come out of a rotator cuff repair or an ACL reconstruction. We know you need to build strength back up, but we can't go and load you with 65% of your one rep max or more to create that strength and hypertrophy right. response. So instead, we spend you know anywhere from 6 to 12 weeks after our surgery doing a bunch of exercises that we all call strength exercises, but in reality, all they do are minimize atrophy. Yeah. Would be my belief. Uh, there's probably some people that disagree with me on that, but I mean, there's. No, I don't disagree. I, if, if we're talking like after an ACL, you're doing a bunch of straight leg raises. Straight leg raises, if, if you or I tore our ACL, straight leg raise is not going to create strength or hypertrophy. Exactly, yeah. Blood flow restriction for those people can take those really low intensity resistance exercises and actually turn them into exercises that create strength and hypertrophy. So that would be the first set of people was the post-op. Second set of people was irregular injury. So yeah. somebody comes to me with tennis elbow or patellar tendinopathy, blood flow restriction can help us strengthen the muscles around that joint as well as lead to that giant growth hormone release that we talked about which can help their tendons heal up faster. The growth hormone release with blood flow restriction training is actually 1.7 times higher that than that of high intensity resistance exercise. So if you go to any internet forum and listen to what people say about growth hormone, they're going to tell you, bro, you got to go squat and deadlift because it's going to lead to growth hormone release, which is going to make you jacked and tan. Yeah. Which like, like, we, like we talked about earlier, growth hormone isn't a, isn't a protein synthesis or hypertrophy thing, but that growth hormone release with exercise is very, very important. And if you can get a higher one with blood flow restriction, that's good because the loads with blood flow restriction training are typically so low that you're not going to break the tendon down anymore. Right. So that lateral epicondylitis person, I can't go make them do some really heavy wrist extensions because it's going to make the tendon really mad. But if we do blood flow restriction, we can create some strength in that muscle group. We can 
release enough growth hormone to maybe start increasing healing times in that tendon. So that's group number two. And performance uh, is the last group one. Group number three is performance. So there have been a couple studies, and we'll start more endurance, and then I guess we can talk about strength athletes yeah. after that. Um, one study actually looked at walking. They had college basketball players, so people that we already know have a, a generally good baseline of aerobic conditioning. They had these college basketball players walk twice a day for 15 minutes with blood flow restriction tourniquets on each leg. It was and 15 they, minutes straight out, or did they do um, like intervals, or how did they set that up? They did three minutes of walking with one minute of rest for five cycles. So it was 15 minutes of total walking. So interval sort of. Yeah, like three on, three one, on one, one off half. times five. Twice a day for, twice a day, six days a week, two weeks. The group that did the uh, walking with blood flow restriction tourniquets on had an 11.6% increase in VO2 max. And they also had significant, wow. significantly increased strength and cross-sectional area of their thigh. Cross-sectional area is basically uh, muscle mass. And that was with walking. And there's no other modality out there, treatment protocol out there, where you're going to get a, uh, a hypertrophy and VO2 max increase at the same time. Typically, those two variables work exactly opposite of each other. There have also been a number of studies looking at cycling. There's actually been more on cycling than walking. And they found that putting blood flow restriction tourniquets on a leg uh, during various different lengths and protocols for cycling increased leg strength, muscle size, and VO2 max. So if you're somebody looking to, you know, if we're talking to uh, a marathoner or a triathlete that we know that they need to keep their strength up. Those guys, if all they do is run and swim and bike, they tend to lose a lot of strength over the course of training for that event. And they need to keep their strength high performance-wise. Maybe they could, instead of going to the gym and lifting a few days a week, which is going to require them loading their body heavy when they're already pounding the crap out of their body, Exactly. maybe yeah. they could do a couple, two or three days a week of 15-minute blood flow restriction exercises and create good strength and hypertrophy gains, also get potential for VO2 max increases, and they're not going to have the, the muscle damage that they would get if they were to go do some heavy squats for that strength gain. Yeah. And that lack of muscle damage goes a long ways towards athletes who are already training at a high volume. Whether you're an endurance athlete or a strength athlete, if you're at, if you're at the top of your game, the most important thing you can do is to work on that skill. Right. If you're an endurance athlete and, you know, this week sucks, what are you, what are you going to prioritize? Yeah. Squats and lunges or running? Well, it should be running. You need to develop that skill as much as possible. But if you can use BFR as a way to maybe shortcut some of those gains or not add more taxing training volume to your week, that's going to go a long way as to your performance in your skill. Sure. You know, and, and this kind of brings us to the conversation of something like a CrossFit athlete because, you know, the competitive CrossFit athletes that I work with, a two-a-day is not uncommon. In fact, mm -hmm. that's probably more the norm than it is for them to just have one workout a, a day. So I look at this in a standpoint of, well, okay, this has been shown to improve cardiovascular output and strength and hypertrophy, which three very important things for – a sport that is essentially a sport of exercising. So if they can do that as a, uh, let's say, a second session of the day without breaking themselves down and improve some of these hormonal outputs that help with recovery, that could be a really big benefit for some of these people that are already functioning at such a high level, right? Yeah, so how, I would probably break that up into two things. We've got some athletes that know that they have certain muscle groups that are weak that are right. holding them back. So... Um, Let's take somebody that knows, like, my overhead press strength sucks. And they need to get that better f from a performance standpoint. But at this point, they have already got to train with CrossFit and a variety of movements and variety of energy systems. If you want to be at the absolute tops, like you said, Danny, you've got to be working out 10 times a week. A ton. Yeah. So when do you add in more overhead pressing volume? You can do it. That 
will have the potential to take away from the rest of your training volume for the week. At a certain point, you just can't add more and have your body recover unless you're doing some uh, fancy other stuff. And I was say messing with the chemical set? Messing with there, the like chemical chem set. set. <laughs> yeah, so, so that's where blood flow restriction training could come in, is you could say, all right, my overhead press sucks, so now I'm going to go do some blood flow restriction training. And I'm gonna I'm gonna do overhead press, but now I'm only gonna do it at 20% of my one rep max. Right. And so you can still strengthen that pattern in those muscles, but at a much lower level, without the muscle damage, you still get the the muscle protein synthesis. You don't get the damage, so you only get the positives. The the short term effects, as far as like fatigue and decrease in torque, aren't gonna affect you if you do BFR at night and then you plan on then going and doing, you know, max effort jerks the next morning, you'll be fine and you'll be fully recovered from that blood flow restriction training the night before. Then on the the second standpoint is you have people that maybe you're dealing with, or you've, you've dealt with recurring injuries. So every, every time the open pops up and your training volume is really high to get ready for the open or the regionals you get a little bit of patellar tendinopathy or pull-ups. Anytime your pull-up volume gets really high, you start to get lateral epicondalgia. Maybe you can supplement your training with blood flow restriction specific to that area for the growth hormone release. And we can say, you know what, we're going to go ahead and make sure that, that you're getting the growth hormone release to help your patellar tendon recover as much as possible so that you don't constantly get sidelined by that tendon pain. Absolutely. And I, I think the other in- interesting thing that, that um, can go hand in hand with this is the fact that, uh, like, for instance, the Chinese sports scientists, they do a lot of research on um, Olympic lifting. And what they found is, like, tricep strength is a big indicator of how much you can jerk, which, which sounds pretty obvious, right? Um, but, but as they've dialed this in with research, they – when I was at World Weightlifting Championships back in um, Houston in November, I noticed the Chinese were doing all these like weighted deadlift or uh, weighted uh, dips and very tricep based um, auxiliary exercises, and it's because they're trying to build the strength, right? Well, w- what if you can take this and extrapolate that to look? We take this research and we realize the stronger your triceps are, the more you can jerk. Let's get your strength in your triceps increased without making you really sore, and then let's see how your jerk looks after that. You know, and, and so so some of this from a strength standpoint, it looks like it could be very sports specific. Is that are you using that at this point with any? I know you work with a decent amount of Olympic lifters, but is that a decent? Is that something you're already doing? So I'm not as specific into this is what the research shows that most lifters jerk is 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 correlated with their triceps, but I do got have lifters that. You know, feel like one guy says that his bicep and pec strength is what right. limits him the most, and he's a very, very elite lifter. That's so, funny though. So you think like you wouldn't think that with those two muscle huh? groups, hmm. yeah, yeah. I but I, I guess it's it's something that's never isolated. As an elite Olympic lifter, how often are your quads, hamstrings, and glutes going to be sore? Right, be weak? right, right, exactly. Uh, but he's probably never because he comes from a CrossFit and weightlifting background, he's, he's never done a whole lot of isolation in that area. So for him, we could isolate what he feels like as a specific weakness. We've got another athlete that says that, that she's, quote, a weak Olympic lifter. It's not her technique that limits her from, from lifting more weight. It's just strictly strength. Yeah. And she's already squatting four days a week and, you know, doing pulls and the standard clean and jerk and snatch. So, so what does she do? She can't continually add more sets of squat or more days of squat. So what if we augment her training with once a week doing some blood flow restriction training as a way to get some of that strength and hypertrophy, but not, not add more taxing volume to her week? Yeah, that's, that's a great way to look at it too, because if you're not breaking her down, but you're building her, her up in a sense... Um, that's a pretty unique thing. And, and you know, the, the growth hormone side, especially the tendon uh, recovery side, is really interesting. I, I have a decent amount of, um, this may sound odd, but a uh, decent amount of stunt guys that I work with in Atlanta. They actually film a lot of movies there and, and TV shows and stuff. And for some reason, we've actually started, like, seeing just a bunch of stunt guys. And not to out stunt guys, but the large majority of them that I work with are, like, taking 
growth hormone. Like they just inject themselves with growth hormone from overseas. And it's not, it has nothing to do with physique. physique. It has to do with recovery. And these are people that like fall down elevator or escalators for a living. That's where they or run through a wall. I mean, like their job is very, very physical. And not only that, they're very expendable. You know, there's a lot of people who want to be stunt guys. So if you get hurt, it's like kind of next man up thing. And they take growth hormone for purely recovery. So I look at this in terms of almost uh, a way, let's say you're a busy person, right? And you maybe can't put the time in for recovery, but you want to be fit and you want to maybe just so you get to the gym two, three days a week. Well, if you could do a blood flow restriction training session of some sort on your own, uh, a week, one or two times a week, that may be a great way to keep yourself not just healthy, but also improve some of these other strength, cardiovascular and hypertrophy sides of it as well. So do you think it has its place in um, every, not necessarily just sports stuff, but also just your everyday like office worker? Oh, absolutely. If you're limited on time, it's a quick way to get an incredibly intense workout in, in one area. Right. If you were to put a tourniquet on each of your legs and do air squats in 10 minutes, your legs are toasted. You're not going to be able to do anything after that. You'll recover from it fairly quickly, but it is a very good way to get some quick work in or, you know, like the, the study on college basketball players, a 15 minute walk with a tourniquet on can create a VO two max and, and strength and hypertrophy yeah. response. That's huge. You can walk your dog and do that, right? I it's, mean, like the, the research behind it is, there's a lot of research behind it for kind of how young it is in America. And it's going to be really interesting to see as we go from more of this preliminary stuff to the really long-term studies and especially getting into the performance-based studies, which most of the studies on it right now are, aren't at athletic performance. It's just, do you get stronger? Right. Do you get a hormone release? Yes, we know that. And so the next step with a lot of stuff is going to be, do you recover from injuries a lot faster? Can you perform better? And I think as much as anything as you and I have probably seen in physical therapy and rehab, the the promise of this is probably better than I would say anything else out there right now. Yeah, it's it's pretty impressive. Um, I can say just you know clinically myself, it's probably in the last five years, you know the, the most. Uh, the, the thing that I've added in my clinical practice that's made the most difference in terms of patients that I work with, I would say five years ago, it, it was dry needling. Dry, from dry needling, it was, it was something I would do very early on, and it was something very different that you get this unique response with. And then now uh, blood flow restriction is, is kind of the next thing that, that we're layering on in terms of trying to normalize some of these asymmetries. And, and, and you and I have even talked about like some of these non fully rehabbed um, post operative issues which which cause serious long term problems for people mm -hmm. you know you have this surgery and let's say you have this little baby calf on one side because you had an ACL surgery or an, an Achilles um, rupture that's repaired and 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 now you have a calf that's like 60% the size of the other side I mean and that's not uncommon and I've seen this yeah. a decent amount in the last few months that can affect your squat it can affect your running it can cause you to have hip issues on the other side because now you're you're uh, loading it more. So in, in terms of um, hypertrophy, you know, and what you've seen, I, I know we kind of talked about normalizing some of that stuff. So what have you seen in terms of your ability to build some of that strength and, and not just strength, but size back up as well? Yeah. So what you refer to there, when somebody's had a surgery and never fully gets their muscle mass back, the, the most common and most researched thing with that is ACL reconstruction. Right. There's a lot of research that shows that um, and one study showed that 65% of patients one year out from an ACL reconstruction had a greater than 20% loss in quad strength. It was either quad strength or quad hypertrophy. I'm not exactly sure. One year out, which is ridiculous. Yeah. And you and I see clinically all the time people that come in and post-surgery their muscle mass in a certain area is 25% of what their other leg looks like. We've seen people post ACL um, whose vastus medialis, kind of the teardrop muscle on the inside of the quads is completely gone. You can't see anything there. It looks like somebody took a scalpel and just cut that muscle out. Yeah. And they're in this, this state called anabolic resistance. If we go back to the muscle growth formula of muscle 
gain equals muscle protein synthesis minus muscle protein breakdown. Well, the surgery and the, the resultant lack of quad activation post-surgery makes the muscle protein breakdown very big. And their body never recovers the ability to create the muscle protein synthesis side of it again. So even if they're you know, doing their squats, their deadlifts, their lunges, leg press, whatever, their body literally will not put the muscle mass back on in that area. And there's really nothing that they can do to right. do that. And blood flow restriction, because of that huge muscle protein synthesis effect without the breakdown, is the only thing that I really know of right now that helps to break up that cycle. And so for a lot of those guys that that never recovered from that surgery. It is the thing that helps them get over the hump and can get them back to building muscle mass and serious strength again and stop these chronic injuries that they get post-surgery because they their body literally would not make the jump to 100%. Yeah, you know, and you bring up a good point too. It's like, you know, how do you go about building this back up? When and this isn't this isn't uh, if you've never had a surgery, it's kind of hard to relate to this, but how do you take somebody that has a painful joint and load them with enough weight to be able to build muscle when their joint hurts, right? And and it's inhibited. Maybe they're swelling this inhibiting and contraction, all kinds of stuff. And and you know, I remember having these sports clinic days when I was in the army where it would be all the ortho surgeons would come down, all the PTs would come together, and we'd have 50, 60 people in a day in an afternoon actually where they'd come together and we'd go over progressions or people that maybe we thought needed surgery, they'd take a look at them and schedule them for it if they, if they did. Uh, but, but over and over and over again, I'd hear from our docs, they're like, uh, just get their strong, get their quads stronger. That was like the answer for everything in the knee. It was, it was really annoying. Everything, yeah. You know, everything in the knee is like get their quads stronger. And and you're right, it was atrophied. And and it's and 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 my response was like, well, how am I supposed to do that if everything we do hurts? You know, like I can't really load them enough to be able to do it because their knee hurts so bad that it's inhibited. And uh, this is kind of an interesting way to. Um, to, to kind of get around that and be able to build strength. And because and, it's a vicious cycle people fall into. And oftentimes I see more people that don't fully rehab than the ones that do. And it's kind of, it kind of sucks because the whole point of having a surgery is so you can be better afterward, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so what have you noticed from, from the terms of like rebuilding some of that muscle size? Like if you had some pretty good success with that? Yeah, we've got a lot of success lately with – and it takes time. It's, it's definitely not like a you've been that – ACL reconstruction patient and you've had, you know, significant atrophy of your quads for five years, this isn't like you're going to do BFR for, for a month and be good to go. Right. Although BFR has been shown in very short periods to have a hypertrophy effect much shorter than traditional resistance exercise, but it has been very good at getting people over the hurdle. And the big important thing to take away from this though, is that, that we use this as a tool to jumpstart that hypertrophy effect a way to augment the hypertrophy effect, but it, it never replaces high intensity training. Right. If you give me the choice between doing blood flow restriction squats or squats at 80% of one rep max, every damn day of the week, I am going to tell you to do heavy squats. Actually, I mean, you can see my shirt right now. My shirt says heavy squats fix everything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, it's, you can't replace it, but this can be something to, you know, help you maybe take some shortcuts or, fix some things that your body hasn't been able to fix on its own. Yeah, it's 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 such a cool stimulus because you're right, it works very well uh, with traditional strength and conditioning um, programming. And uh, I think it's just a matter of time before the strength and conditioning community, the smart, smart coaches, really smart strength coaches start applying this with their programming in, in, a, in, in a long-term state. Yeah, I'd say it's already in the bodybuilding community. Right. Yeah, that's a, true. A decent amount, but I think we're going to see in the next five years, especially as you know more performance based stuff comes out, we're going to see the college strength coach yep. look at his athlete and say, "Man, this offensive lineman would be so much better if his if his punch was ten percent more powerful." Yeah. And he's like, "I'm already training this dude four days a week. He's going to practice five days a week. I can't." add any more we're going to see people get really smart with how they program it performance wise specific to athletes weakness and i think that's an interesting point with sports science right so like you say like it's interesting that the chinese have looked at 
what areas limit your ability to lift or what, what areas, strong areas, make these lifters so uh, successful. And it's lower back extensor strength and tricep strength are the, t- the two big areas, right? So, um, you know, if you can figure out a way to build those without breaking yourself down and now, you know, that may not be successful in a baseball player, right? That, that could be completely different. In fact, you could probably say posterior cuff strength would be a big deal for them. And now, yeah. all right, let's extrapolate that on, on a pitcher. Let's say we can build up their posterior cuff strength. Does that increase their velocity? Maybe, maybe not. But does that decrease their risk of having a rotator cuff issue? Absolutely. Yeah. Right? So um, applying this on top of what you're already doing, but understanding what the specificity of the sport is, I think that's where the real interesting portion of this is. And, and even from the standpoint of strength and conditioning, you know, we can look at something like um, – you know, runners or whatever it might be, you know, runners, let's say runners are, uh, they can build up Achilles, um, and foot strength by doing this and bulletproof themselves from having tendinopathies or, you know, plantar fasciitis or these things that are rampant in the running community. If they can catch it on the front end and build some things up, we can limit a lot of the injuries and, and train more because of it. Yeah. I'd say from a performance standpoint, we talked about this earlier, Danny. Yeah. My squat is a great example of how this can affect your performance. I have the puniest, we both have the puniest calf have the in the world. Yeah. <laughs> and and I, I put a Can't video up on Instagram a while back of me. I, I cleaned 295. And I was very proud that I cleaned 295. But I was scared to put the video up because if you watch me stand it up, I basically hang on my Achilles tendon the entire way up. My squats for a long time, it was just my, my ankles were in maximum dorsiflexion because I believe my calves were so weak that I couldn't push back right. against the loads that I could squat and clean. So I started doing blood flow restriction on my calves, and my calves are still pathetic. They still got a <laughs> long ways to go. But if you look at my squat now, I'm able to actually sit, hold the weight back further. And it, it looks like, to most people, they would look at it and say that I am less quad dominant than I was. And I really think that it's now that I actually have enough calf strength that I don't have to just hang on the tendon right. and, pass, and use that passive structure for, for ankle support. Yeah. Well, it, it makes a lot of sense, man. I mean, I have, yeah, I have the same disease... And we can thank our parents for that, I think. Um, although my brother has really big calves. It's kind of annoying. My dad has awesome calves. So does my guess. dad. So does my dad. the hell? Mom. I, mom, yeah. Mom, I love you, but I'm not happy at you right now. I'm not happy with my calf situation, thanks to you. And, and, and honestly, those are hard areas to build up. You know, I remember playing baseball, and, and we'd spend all this time built, working on forearms. It'd be like forearms every single day everybody wants to have big you know strong forearms and grip strength because it helps with bat speed and and um i would work my ass off on building my forearms up and obviously it didn't work very well um so maybe you know if we look at like baseball right as a hitter if if i was to take this and apply this to a hitter and this is really where the importance of sport specificity comes into play right is is tricep strength going to be as important to a hitter as it is to somebody that olympic lifts no not at all but is is forearm strength and grip strength going to be important? Absolutely. You know, I mean, we can correlate that with bat speed. And with bat speed, we can correlate with how hard you can hit a ball. If you hit a ball harder, you can hit more home runs. And now all of a sudden, you're getting signed to a contract. So, um, you know, I, I think that the important thing is to understand that this is an interesting modality, an interesting exercise kind of uh, option that you can add for specificity for your sport, but also could be for generalized health. And, and, and what do you think about, I mean, I almost look at this as a way where group classes, this could be something where you could do this with um, and have people going through lower extremity protocols or upper extremity protocols and misery love company. And it's not easy to do, you know, it's like CrossFit, right? Like if I do a workout and it says five rounds of X, Y, and Z and I'm, I'm at home, it's very easy for me to say, you know what? Four sounds good at halfway through and say, I'm good to go. But I would never do that in a gym around other people. Well, I, there's there's a lot of benefits for it. Like the biggest thing with group exercise right now that I think is going to come out for a lot of places is uh, group exercise with elderly, and there's oh, going to be totally. some awesome BFR research with the elderly coming out who have a really hard time with the most muscle protein synthesis side of the equation. I think when we're looking at like 
specific sports, we can make generalizations about where most people are weak, and we could try to do that. Do I think some, we would probably be better with more individualized approaches? Yes. But if you go to like the CrossFit Journal uh, and you read anything by Greg Glassman on muted hip function, I think we both know that the majority of athletes out there could benefit from more glute strength yep. and tend to be just from the way we live and the way our society is set up, tend to be a little bit more quad dominant. So could you maybe add in glute specific blood flow restriction training in a group setting to help all the athletes in your CrossFit box maybe have the potential to perform a little bit better or be a little bit more injury proof? Absolutely. I think it's interesting, you know, and we'll see where it goes in a couple of years because this is really the tip of the iceberg and the military has done a good job of really pumping a lot of this stuff out. And, and, uh, it's so cool to see that they're able to do this stuff with amputees and limb salvage patients. And these are people I've worked with, you know, personally for years. And, and, um, these are usually young kids that want to be super active, you know, and I, I mean, I remember vividly, uh, like being beat pretty bad by a guy with a, a gazelle leg in a uh, a couple one mile repeats, and he beat the shit out of me. Uh, not even close, really, in terms of how fast he was running. And you know, I was thinking to myself, I was like, look, this kid, he wants to be competitive. He's young, and and uh, you, the traditional rehab model is not what he's interested in. It's just not really. Uh, it doesn't fit him. He wants more than that. He wants to be more more progressive and more aggressive with his his approach. So uh, it seems like an interesting modality to add in for a lot of different things. So it, it's cool, and I'm glad that you know you're put, putting this out along with obviously Johnny Owens, who is who's a, a mutual friend of ours that that's really been kind of leading the way with this. So uh, it's it's a it's something I'm excited about for my clinical practice, but also I look at it from a performance standpoint. I think it's, there's a lot of a lot of good there. I think it's cool too. I'm glad that you brought up the military stuff that so much of the research on this comes out of the military. And research is never perfect, especially when private companies are involved and and ulterior motives get in place. But I love the fact that so much of this research is military-based because what does the U.S. Army care about? Getting injured soldiers better and saving money. Yep. And so if we have this much military-based research on something, that is way more encouraging to me. Yeah. You know, 10 military research studies to me means a hell of a lot more than a hundred studies performed by oh. big pharmacology company. That's such a good point, man. And, and here's the other thing too, is if, if you're not familiar with research, there's a, there's something called an IRB approval, which is basically before a study is done, it has to be reviewed by an external board to make sure it's ethical. And, it is an extremely long process. It you know it can be months of you having to submit things and resubmit things before you get approval. They're not going to let you just do some random study with human subjects um, because there can be negative consequences for that. And you know the the research that they put out, you're exactly right. This is a socialized medical model. Let's let's just be straight up with that. It's like how can we pay less to get a better result? It's not some big pharmacology. Um, company that is trying to make money and pumping a bunch of money into researchers where they really want the result that they want, not what necessarily the res- the research shows. I mean, could you imagine dropping a million dollars in a study and it shows that your pill isn't as as ex- effective as a sugar pill? Like, that study hard. doesn't get published. That's so it, not at all, right? Not at all. And I've been a part of studies in the military that we didn't find what we wanted to, and we still published that data. It was the, you know the 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 study was inconclusive of one way or another, and uh, and it's because what we want is exactly what Zach said. So, you know, the take this with more than you would like a traditional study, and, and that's why we I think we're so excited about this. Is in our realm, it's a game changer, and there's very few things we can say that about and be honestly like uh, serious about it. Absolutely. Yeah. So you know, going forward, Zach. You know, if you want to learn more about this, obviously Johnny Owens, OwensRecoveryScience.com is a great place to learn about it. Um, you've got some stuff on your own website and and uh, some other you know really cool just like blog content and and videos and all kinds of stuff. Um, where can people find out more about you and what you're doing? Yeah. So if you go to the thebarbellphysio.com, that's kind of the main hub for everything I do. Um, right now, uh, I've got a friend of mine has an ebook that's available via my store on blood flow restriction training, more teaching you how to apply that research. Um, It's a a great ebook by Dr. Mario Novo of liftersclinic.com. 
Um, but from there, I've got a lot of articles that will be coming out here in the next few weeks on implementing blood flow restriction from a performance standpoint. Right now, like, we, like we've talked about, so much of it is from a clinical standpoint, but uh, we're going to start getting more stuff coming out performance-based and how you can use that as a crossfitter or an Olympic lifter or a uh, uh, aerobic-based athlete using that to augment your current training. Yeah, and that, uh, let's be honest, man. If you, nobody cares about being hurt until they're hurt, yeah. everybody cares about performance. Period. It's where it's at. So hopefully we can sugarcoat some injury prevention with performance and uh, and get people kind of start doing this more. So, um, Zach, dude, thanks for your time. This has been a lot of fun. I really enjoyed the presentation that you did and, and, uh, and spreading the message of some of this stuff. And um, don't forget, guys, if you have a body, you're an athlete.